Okay. Tonight, uh, Dear Exiles, that is my title. Um, we have been talking about uh, exiles. We, we started in the book of Daniel. I, I was putting some of the messages on YouTube this week, and I found out that I have the exact same um, title for the first message of this series, Welcome to Babylon, uh, as some church in South Carolina. But I promise I did not copy them uh, because ours came out the week before them. So there, ha, we win. Um, and theirs were like really three or four times as long. So you're lucky. You're very fortunate. Uh, but um, we, we started out saying welcome to Babylon. We talked about Daniel. We talked about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We talked about uh, this idea of living in exile in a, in a foreign land, in a land that is hostile sometimes to your faith and certainly not open to it. And what kinds of things you have to do. Um, Daniel and the guys did a lot of negotiation. They tried to figure out how is it we're going to um, honor God and honor this new kingdom that we're a part of. The second week we talked about the fact that sometimes there are days when you go, okay, this is a line too far. This is a line I can't cross. And uh, so we called that crossing the line. And we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, okay, we, we can learn the language and the culture of the Babylonians. We can, um, we can uh, serve in the temple, or excuse me, serve uh, in the palace with the king. But we can't bow down and worship uh, his giant idol that he set out in the desert and worship that as God. So they got thrown in a furnace and they lived and everything was great. And then years later in Daniel's life, we talked about last week, excuse me, a couple of weeks ago, crossing the lion, where Daniel continued to do the things he had always done. And uh, the result of that was people tried to get him uh, destroyed. They actually tried to get him killed. They tried to get him out of his place of leadership and power because uh, he was far too effective and he was making people look bad. And they couldn't find anything wrong with his life except for the fact that he prayed and that he served God. So, uh, so that's what happened to Daniel. He, as an old man, probably in his 70s or 80s, got thrown into a lion's den, survived the lions. That was super cool, too. And we learned a lot about how to uh, live in our current culture from those stories. Last week, we talked about Joseph, who has a dream uh, and then gets sold into slavery. And we called that surprise endings. We talked about the fact that sometimes you set out in a certain path in your life and you end up something radically completely different, and yet God's hand is still in it, and that's what happened to him. So moving to the New Testament this week, this idea that we are exiles, the, this idea that we are foreigners and strangers, even in our own country, because we have given our lives over to Jesus, and that means that the way that we live, the things that we believe, are sometimes different than the world around us. So one uh, reaction to that has always been to shrink in and build nicer buildings and uh, better church cultures and make sure that nobody ever has to be a part of the big, bad, scary world out there. And our approach has been kind of the opposite. We believe that God calls us and sends us out into the world. And that when we come together on Sunday nights, the idea is not that, um, oh, phew, now we're safe from the big bad world and we don't have to go out there anymore. No, this is preparation. This is us saying, uh, I want to be full of the spirit of Christ. I want to be full of Christ when I go into my world. I was talking to uh, a friend who's a believer and we, we, um, we both work in the same industry together this week. We were talking about the fact that when we come to work, we come very different than everybody else because a lot of people are coming to work or they're coming into school or they're coming into whatever in their life trying to find fulfillment, trying to find hope and help and trying to find some meaning. And, and uh, there's even a lot made in the business community about how you should try to make sure you give your employees a chance to you know, do something meaningful and give back to the world and do charity work or whatever it happens to be so that it's not just I'm just doing my work every day. I should find some significance there. But as people who follow Jesus, it's exactly the opposite. We come into work or school or life or wherever we are full of Christ, full of something that we have 
that gives us fulfillment, that gives us meaning, that gives us purpose, that tells us who we are and where we are and why we belong uh, in the world and where we came from and where we're headed to. And we step into that situation with that information and with that fulfillment. So we don't need anybody to fulfill us, but we come in looking for how can I give away what Jesus has done in my heart and in my life into my world? Um, how, how, do I, uh, how do I teach someone else how to lean on Jesus and how um, to, uh, to commit themselves to him so that they can live freely and lightly like we're talking about? So um, I was reading uh, 1 Peter uh, a while back as we were thinking about this series of messages. And, and if there's any book in the New Testament that really encapsulates this situation that we're in as exiles, it's probably 1 Peter. I call 1 Peter a, a Dear Exiles letter. So it's like a Dear John letter, but it's just to exiles. And I want to read a considerable portion of it to you tonight. And you're, you're thinking, wow, that just sounds like a whole lot of fun. John is going to read a whole book of the Bible to us. Yay! I want to read it to you because it's actually kind of for us. And I want you to remember that this is Peter. This is the Peter. This is Apostle Peter. This is walk on water a little and then sink a lot. Uh, this is cut a guy's ears off, Peter. This is cussing out a servant girl, deny me three times before the rooster crows. And then day of Pentecost, preach to thousands of people who get saved. And that's that Peter. But this is a long, long time later. And this is much older Peter. In a lot of ways, this is Pastor Peter, which is something I don't want to say a lot because it makes me giggle. Um, Pastor Pete, I don't know why. Uh, and he writes this letter, and Silas helps him write it. And his first letter um, is we call First Peter, and he writes it to all the churches that he knows of in the area. And his whole message is this: Hey, dear exiles. We may not be together now, and we may not be together in the future. And you will likely live your life, the rest of your life, in exile like this. And if I have a chance to talk to you, here's a few things I want you to remember, and here is a few things you need to know to live in exile. So let's pretend this letter is written to us, okay? I've taken good chunks of it. Because if you just forget that Peter is sending this out over 2,000 years ago and you listen to the things he says, they're, they're not inappropriate for us. In fact, it kind of sounds like Peter was writing to us today. So let's pretend Peter wrote this to us today here in exile. Let's take a few notes if you have something to write on or you can take mental notes otherwise. Things that you want to think about some more. I'm going to read most of this to you, and then I wrote a bunch of editorial comments in the middle of it, and we'll see how far we get on this thing. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's how he opens the letter, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, let's add ourselves in, and America. Yay! Thank you, Peter. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, to be sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. So Peter writes to exiles. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us a new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And in all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. There's something so warm in this next section, and it's, it's so different than early on Peter, young Peter. This is Pastor Pete. Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
I, when I read this, I picture him thinking back so many years before to Jesus, thinking about walking with him, talking with him, being close with him. He said, I've seen him, but even though you have not seen him, you love him. What an amazing thing. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter is saying, look, your inheritance, the thing that you get at the end of all of this, your reward is secure because it's in heaven, because you've put your hope in Christ. And you may, not, you may suffer now, but the end result is salvation. Because, and because of this, you have an inexpressible and glorious joy. Wouldn't that be a great thing to take out into your world this week? Wouldn't it be a great thing to take into your family and into your workplace and into your school, into your neighborhood? I think proper perspective changes our feelings and attitudes. Peter is saying, look, you already have everything. It's stored up for you. So you can go through your life with great peace and great comfort and inexpressible joy because everything that you believe in and everything that you're working for, you already have, that God keeps it for you. You're unbreakable. You can't be bought or sold or bribed or cajoled. You already have everything through Jesus. And um, I, I've taken, uh, the, <laughs> taken up saying this phrase because, you know, about a billion times a day, somebody asks you how you're doing, and most of the time, they do not care. Um, but they would, would like, to, it's just a thing we say, hey, how are you doing? Um, if somebody really actually wants to know and stops for 13 seconds to listen, I always say, uh, in the grand scheme of my life, in the big arc that is me, I am totally blessed beyond my ability to contain it. As Peter was saying, now today I may be stressed out or tired or got some sort of sinus headache thing going on or whatever it happens to be. I may be, you know, the, the kids may have had a particularly crazy day. But if I look at my life, as Peter is saying, look at your life. Look at the grand scheme of things. You are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy because you have been blessed and that everything that you have is secure through Jesus. Back to verse 13 of chapter 1. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, I want you to take note of that phrase because Peter's going to use that phrase a lot. In fact, I, I am wondering if Peter was trying to get at something because he uses the word sober at least four times in this entire book. He uses this phrase alert and sober or alert and fully sober a lot, which is making me thinking that the exiles might have had some sort of drinking problem. Um, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Now since, uh, skipping down to verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Peter, in a couple of verses before, says you've been redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your fathers with Jesus' blood. You're no longer ignorant. You you know better. You know how to live alert and sober. You know how to live in a non-destructive way. And uh, I think that's important to understand. I choose to be alert and sober, not just in the drugs and alcohol sober kind of way, but also in the situational awareness kind of sober, where uh, you are aware of what's going on in the world, and you're aware that every day passes and it can pass without you noticing unless you stop to say, what is the meaning of today and what is God's purpose for me today? And how does God want to use me today in every situation that he'll put me in? Therefore, rid yourselves of all kind of malice. That's like bad intentions, 
deceit, that would be lying, stealing, cheating, um, falsely representing the truth, uh, exaggerating. Um, think of all those words that go with that. Hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. It's interesting that he puts in envy and slander. Envy is looking around at somebody else and saying, I, I wish I were where they are, or I wish I had what they have. Slander is um, saying something about somebody else that's destructive. This section is called Living Godly Lives in a Pagan Society. We're already to chapter 2. We're doing really good. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, there he is again saying we are exiles, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. How will we live a godly life in pagan society? Live such good lives among the pagans. And pagan is not a derogatory term in this sense. It just means someone who doesn't follow Jesus. That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God the day he visits us. I'm going to read that one again. Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Hmm. Live such good lives among the pagans. I capitalize that word. Among not separated from, not in different communities and camps, not in walled villages to keep people out, but among, so that they may see your good deeds. Sometimes we take Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 6, uh, where he talks about, you know, don't, when you're doing something good, don't do it to be seen by men. And we say, well, I want to keep all of my good deeds private and hidden, and I want to make sure nobody knows that I pray or read my Bible or go to church or anything like that because I don't want to be prideful about it. But Peter is saying, no, let people see your good deeds. Let them see the good choices that you make. Let them see that your life is radically different in some way. And that's not a matter of pride or arrogance or being religious. That's a matter of letting people see who you really are. And we talked about Daniel, and he, when he prayed, he opened up his window. He didn't keep himself hidden, although that would have been a smart thing to do when uh, a lion's den is on the line. And yet, he always did it publicly. He always did it openly, and he continued to do the same thing that he was always doing. Live such good lives that they may see your good deeds. Honor the emperor. Are you sure, Peter? This does not seem like, number one, this does not seem like young Peter with the sword and the attacking the people and all that kind of thing. Um, this also does not seem like maybe something that people in his day would have found very easy. This is not, you know, hey, I respect the leader of our country, even though I totally politely disagree with his political views on certain issues. This is choosing to honor the leader of a despotic occupying empire. You're talking about the emperor is Caesar, Augustus, Nero, pick an emperor. These are not particularly fuzzy people. These are the people who invented crucifixion. These are the people who have occupied and taken over the area. And yet Peter says, fear God, love all the brethren, honor the emperor. It's a tall order, but... Pastor Peter said we have to. So we have to. And I think sometimes in a country that's really bitterly divided against political lines, that maybe the best thing we can do is in trying to figure out, instead of trying to figure out what is the right Christian political line to take, maybe we ought to just, I don't know, avoid that kind of thing um, and, and honor the leaders and the authorities and the police and all those kinds of things and spend our time talking about things that really matter because you don't always have many opportunities to talk to somebody. And 
I find when that conversation happens, I want to make sure that I don't spend all of the few precious moments I have talking with somebody about what I think spent on dumb things like politics. But more importantly, I want to talk about the things that really matter and the things that are eternal. And, and our government is our government, and we can be involved in politics and all those kinds of things. It's not bad and it's not wrong. But when I am talking to the world around me, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time trying to figure out what side of the political spectrum they're on. I want to know what side of the Jesus spectrum they're on. So chapter 3, and I'm skipping large sections of this, but that's okay. You'll get a chance to catch up on it later. Suffering for doing good. Verse 8, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay, repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because, what? because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Skipping down, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. You know, sometimes I talk to people and they say, well, you know, I, I go out to school or work or wherever, and nobody really asks me about my faith. Nobody says, hey, tell me more about Jesus. I'd just like to learn some more about that. It just seems like a good topic of discussion for lunch today. But they may ask you about your actions. They may ask you about your attitude. They may ask you about your approach to things. And as Paul was, or Peter was saying, as you live such a good life that people can see your actions and they go, man, there is something very, very different, fundamentally different in the way that you approach everyday life. Someone may ask you a question that leads into that discussion about Jesus. The question I got asked um, a, a few weeks ago by someone was, hey, where did you learn about leadership? Um, where did you learn about, you know, managing people? Where did you learn about leading people? And I said, well, that's a funny conversation to have, actually. Um, yes, I work in the software industry now, but... I spent uh, a good, you know, 10 years of my life learning about how to be a pastor of a church. And then I was a pastor of a church and I did budgets and I hired people and had to let people go and all kinds of things like that. And um, so I've, you know, run organizations from five people all the way up to 500 people. And that's how I learned about organizational management and, and how to deal with people. And that was a great conversation because it opened up this door to talk about faith and to talk about um, the things that really matter and to talk about the Jesus question. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, I think sometimes we've got this idea, especially in evangelical Christianity, that what we ought to be doing is approaching people with... Um, forcefulness and disrespect, that uh, we ought to have our signs and our placards ready, or we ought to have our quick, witty responses ready, and we ought to remind everybody that they're doing bad things and we're not doing bad things. Peter says, do this with gentleness and respect. Be ready to give an answer for someone who asks about your hope. Um, for this next section, I have to define a word for you. Um, I'm going to define this word for you so that you don't look it up on the internet. Um, it is the word debauchery, okay? Debauchery. Um, don't look that up on the internet. That will be a bad search result for you. Um, <clears throat> it means excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures or intemperance. Again, do not Google that. Next section, living for God. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, excessive indulgence and sensual pleasures, intemperance. 
lust, drunkenness, orgies. Those words exa mean exactly what they sound like. Carousing, detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Interesting. He says, you know, you spent a lot of time in your life doing all of these things, and people are now surprised that you don't do them anymore. They're surprised that you don't join them in this reckless behavior, and they heap abuse on you. I've had that happen once or twice. There's been kind of a movement in the church of late to blur some of these lines. To say, well, you know, some of these things maybe are not so bad, but I think it's important to make sure you know some people well enough for them to be surprised that you don't join in their reckless way of living. That means they have to know enough about you to know about the choices you make in that kind of a situation. They have to know about the kinds of decisions that you make. They have to know what you did on the weekend. They might have to know what you did on a weeknight. You have to know somebody well enough to know, I make different choices than you do. Hmm, I'm interested in that. Coming close to the end. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. There it is again. So that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Last chapter. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up and do it time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And again, verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And he ends his letter with peace to all of you who are in Christ. I like that Peter ends with a peace out. Thank you, Pastor Pete. That was a lovely letter. Um, when I read that, I, I don't hear Peter 2,000 years ago, although there's a lot of contextual stuff in there. It all just speaks to me of what we are trying to do every day. And he's saying, look, this is how you live. This is how you do it. You, you live in such a way that it's clear to everyone. And you're ready to give an answer for why you live that way. And you do it with gentleness and respect and love and kindness. And, and you're, you know, you're not um, ignorant anymore. And you're not living a destructive kind of a life anymore. So, some questions. Uh, I have three questions tonight. And uh, I'll give you the one more thing before we, before we end so that we can talk and then we'll just be done for tonight. Um, uh, for one more thing tonight, I want to give you a challenge. This is a great letter, and it really applies to, to what we're trying to live every day. So I want to challenge you to take this letter. There are five chapters to the book of First Peter, and they're not very long. They probably take you 10 minutes to read. I want to encourage each of us to grab one of those chapters every morning for the next five days. So chapter one on Monday, chapter two on Tuesday, chapter three on Wednesday. Okay, good. I got it. Uh, you can do the rest of the math there because apparently I can't. Uh, and read one of those chapters every day and ask God, how, what do I apply from this today? What do I do with this today? How does this work in my life today? So three questions. Number one, what's stuck in your brain or your heart from Pastor Peter's letter? Uh, you can talk about that at your table. Two, which of these teachings do you feel is the most relevant to your life today? The things that you heard. And the third thing, is there anything in this Dear Exile letter you struggle with understanding or applying? So I'm going to close in prayer now so that we're done and you can talk as long as you want and I won't interrupt you. Jesus, thank you for inspiring 
Pastor Peter to write a letter to all of us exiles and help us to figure out how this works. I, um, I, I don't understand all of it. I'm trying to figure it out every day. I'm trying to figure out what the line is between um, being bold and being gentle and respectful. And uh, help us to figure out where that is. Figure out the right opportunities and help us to be full of your spirit when we walk into our world. And help us to hear from this letter the things that you're wanting to work on in our own hearts and to prepare us uh, for the work ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.